Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. I'm really honored and privileged to be able to introduce the speaker for this evening. So I'll go ahead and do that. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz is a writer, educator, historian, and activist. She grew up in rural Oklahoma, the daughter of a tenant farming family, and she has been active in the international indigenous movement for more than four decades and is known for her lifelong commitment to national and international social justice issues. She is the author or editor of over 13 books, including Roots of Resistance, A History of Land Tenure in New Mexico, An Indigenous People's History of the United States, and co-author of All the Real Indians Died Off and 20 Other Myths About Native Americans. She is known for her ability to rewrite history confronting the dominant narratives that are often based on misconceptions and inherent fallacies. I was personally drawn to her work because of my own research interests, which include finding tangible methods to combat historical declension narratives, a declension narrative being any story of change over time that traces a secular decline or deterioration in historical phenomena. In other words, it is any story that is told progressively worse over time in a non-cyclical way. My work investigates how prisoner activism of the 1970s created a debilitating historical declension narrative. And while reading Loaded, I found that this brilliantly written, disarming history of the Second Amendment is inextricably linked to the prisoners' rights movement, as it is to many other liberation movements that have occurred in the past and that are occurring present day. A radical group that was a primary target for incarceration during the late 60s and early 70s was the Black Panther Party who was also heavily involved in the prisoners' rights movement. And the main source of contention and controversy that often found the Black Panthers locked away, their guns. In her new book, Loaded, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz quotes co-founder of the Black Panther Party, Bobby Seale, when he stated, quote, the Black Panther Party for self-defense calls upon the American people in particular to take careful note of the racist California legislation which is considering legislation aimed at keeping the black people disarmed and powerless at the very same time that racist police agencies throughout the country are intensifying the terror, brutality, murder, and repression of black people. End of quote. Dunbar Ortiz notes and emphasizes and re-emphasizes that this is not the moment in history that is cited when gun-loving Americans and the National Rifle Association assert that their right to bear arms is being infringed upon, a right that they believe the sacred U.S. Constitution has granted them. No, this brutal history of disarmament for oppressed peoples is not part of the dominant narrative. This history, however, as Dunbar Ortiz notes in her work, is only a fragment of the history of gun culture in the United States. There has been an increasing discourse centered on gun control with the rise in mass shootings in the last decade, and in her new book, Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz addresses this rise as she refocuses these conversations about the United States gun culture by positioning it within its proper origins of white supremacy and racial capitalism. She meticulously deconstructs the dominant narrative and fallacies surrounding the Second Amendment, and she forces readers to come face to face with the truth about the U.S. and its deep affinity for guns. The reality being that this affinity is rooted in the genocide of indigenous peoples and enslavement and control of black bodies. Dunbar Ortiz argues that understanding the purpose of the Second Amendment is key to understanding the gun culture of the United States. And to quote the publishers weekly in their review of the new book, her argument will be disturbing and unfamiliar to most people, but her evidence is significant and should not be ignored. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roxanne Dunbar. So thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. This is a beautiful library. Um, I was expecting a small place, and this is a beautiful place. I, I want to um, acknowledge that we are on the unceded, a part of the unceded ancestral lands of the Pueblo people who are part of the vast Wintu nation who are still living here today. And I want to thank Jesse Drew so much for organizing this and 
all the other great work he does, bringing speakers and um, just being a great, a great organizer and teacher. I've known uh, Jesse for a long time and seen uh, what he has accomplished. And I thank all the sponsors. And I have a particularly um, deep um, uh, connection with the DSA. How many of you from the DSA? Thank you for coming, and thank you for your work, too. Well, pertinent to my research and writing, I want to ask, how many people have read this book? Oh, good, not many. I won't be too repetitive. Some of it, what I'm trying to do here is sort of take a little bit from each chapter and make it into a, a narrative. But each of the points I'm making have whole chapters that you can then go and read. So hopefully you will do that. Um, and then in the Q&A, of course, um, I hope you will make comments as well as ask questions of what I wasn't clear about or what you disagree with. But it is pertinent to my research and writing on gun proliferation and gun violence in the United States that I grew up in an all-white rural Oklahoma um, with guns and the Bible, <laughs> Southern Baptist. <laughs> so during the worldwide revolutionary era, after I left um, um, left Oklahoma and, and left the Bible, um, <laughs> in that great revolutionary era of the 60s and 70s, uh, in the early 1970s, for one year, I was a member of a group I helped form, an armed radical group in southern Louisiana. We amassed a lot of guns, were members of outdoor and indoor gun clubs, and frequented gun, frequented gun shows. But fortunately, never had occasion to fire the weapons beyond practice. That is to say, I'm intimately familiar with all kinds of handguns, rifles, ammunition of what I call gun love, the first chapter of my book. Firearms draped on your body or a nine millimeter browning tucked in your belt creates a sense of amplified power without which you feel naked and vulnerable. Guns are beautifully crafted objects that are addictive. I would say stay away from them at all costs. Because they are addictive. Think of heroin, for instance. Or gambling too much. At that time, the early 1970s, approximately 50% of all homes in the United States contain a firearm. 112, most of these were single shot rifles or shotguns very few um, sidearms, and almost no high-powered military weapons. So this was 112 million guns and a population of 200 million, still you know, out of proportion to any other country in the world. Uh, but compared to now, <laughs> it's pretty minor. So it was about one or two guns per person for that 50% of people who owned a gun at all. So, but now, where we are now, the number of guns privately owned in the United States have reached, they think, they're different estimates, but the minimum I've seen lately is 390 million in a population of 330 million adults. So the United States is 4.25% of the world's population, but account for 46% of the worldwide total of cultivate of uh, civilian um, held firearms. This amounts to 121 firearms for every 100 residents. But interestingly enough, 
only a third of the U.S. population, a third of adults in the United States, own any gun at all. So 70% simply do not have firearms on their bodies, in their homes, in their cars. I think it's, it's important to understand that perspective. Because that's a lot of guns for actually a minority <coughs> of people. Because what that means is each gun owner possesses an average of eight firearms each. So the third of the population that owns guns are gun hoarders. They are addicts. If you have more than two guns, you're getting there. <laughs> Eight guns, but some of these people, like the shooter in Las Vegas, own 56. I think they're still finding some of his guns. He had seven houses or something. Um, so that, that's extreme addiction. <clears throat> the Pew Research Center states, the general profile of gun owners in the United States differs substantially from the general public. Roughly three quarters, 74% of gun owners are men, and 82% are white. Taken together, 61% of adults who own guns are white men. Nationwide, white men make up only 32% of the U.S. adult population. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the majority of white men so afraid of? <laughs> we cannot make sense of gun hoarding in the U.S. if we don't deal with white nationalism. <clears throat> Centuries of racial and economic domination by white men are integral to the United States culture, views, and institutions. The ongoing influence of this history is compounded by general lack or refusal of knowledge and acknowledgement of the three centuries of white settler colonial savage violence against um, across the continent. as the legacies of two and a half centuries of legalized racial slavery and following emancipation, totalitarian control through such practices as convict leasing, legal segregation called Jim Crow, rampant institutionalized racism, police killings, mass surveillance, criminalization, and mass incarceration. And those are not history, they're now. The militaristic capitalist powerhouse that the United States became by 1840 derived from real estate, property. That includes the value of the bodies of the enslaved Africans, as well as appropriated native land. No other country in the world that I've looked at has based its, its capitalist development purely on land and property, land is property, real estate. So there are a lot of exceptional things about the United States, almost all of them negative. <laughs> so the United States was, was founded as a capitalist state. I call it the corporate state. It was founded basically as a corporation, a businessman, slave owners mostly or you know, slave uh, traders like Alexander Hamilton, and an empire on conquered land with capital in the form of slaves. Now this was exceptional in the world at the time and has remained exceptional. <clears throat> the capitalist firearms industry was the first successful modern corporation. The brain chief, uh, the brainchild of Alexander Hamilton, who founded the Springfield Armory in Western Massachusetts. It was established by the Continental Congress in 1777. The fiscal military state 
the Constitution created proved its most enduring legacy in Indian country and made natives among the biggest losers <coughs> of ratification of the Constitution. Some gun control, I have a whole chapter on what I call the cult of the covenant, the cult of the Constitution and the cult of the cult of the Second Amendment. Some gun control advocates appear to think the Second Amendment was originally about hunting. This blind spot, as well as the racism and erasure of history, can be seen in the following example. After retiring, the late Warren F. Ferber, who served as the 15th Chief Justice of the United States from 1969 to 1986, wrote a long and impassioned plea for gun control, arguing that the Second Amendment was dated and no longer valid. Significantly, he published the commentary in the popular free supplement parade magazine, not in a law journal. So he, he, he wanted it to be popularly read. He wrote, Let's look at the history. First, many of the 3.5 million people living in the 13 original colonies depended on wild game for food. And a good many of them required firearms for their defense from marauding Indians. <coughs> Racist as Berger's language is, he is right about the firearms being used to kill Indians. But regarding <coughs> hunting, actually, these early British settlers, as well as post-independence white rural settlers, primarily used domesticated cattle, hogs, and chickens for food. Mm -hmm. Nearly all their hunting was commercial for the huge, lucrative global capitalist fur trade and mostly they used trapping rather than firearms, taking the skins and leaving the corpse of the animal to rot. Gun use was neither recreational nor necessary for food. Guns were to kill Indians. At the end of World War II, U.S. social, economic, and political order was solidly and confidently a white, patriarchal, Protestant republic, dominated by corporations with investments and financial reserves, along with a massive military machine <coughs> that would quickly become what Eisenhower called a military-industrial complex. Although an elite class of white male bankers, industrialists, and real estate giants owned a third or more of the country's wealth, all white men benefited from what W.E.B. Du Bois called the public and psychological wage of whiteness. The U.S. population was 90% white. 1950. African American descendants of enslaved Africans lived under Jim Crow, of course, in the former Confederate states and were ghettoized and discriminated against when uh, they uh, escaped the South for northern and coastal industrial urban areas where they were stopped by urban police forces and white vigilantes resembling slave patrols. Native Americans were abandoned on shrunken land masses that could not support life, forcing many to work in nearby or faraway cities, while Congress began re 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 um, reversing New Deal reforms, including the congressional imposition of termination of 1953 to erase Native identity completely. Women, especially married women, were legally unequal and subject to gender-segregated labor market. During Harry Truman's second term as president, a Red Scare 
was launched, 1950-1954. It's identified with Senator Joseph McCarthy and Attorney Roy Cohen, uh, but it was much bigger than that. Richard Nixon, for instance. Um, against alleged communists in the U.S. government, army, universities, Hollywood, and other institutions. The anti-Jewish subtext of this vicious campaign became obvious with the 1953 execution of the Rosenbergs. Populist white Christian nationalism formed the basis of the Ku Klux Klan that arose again in the 1950s to counter the black civil rights movement. Then came the bombshell of the 1954 U.S. Supreme Court decision ordering the desegregation of schools. The post 1960s supercharged gun culture and white nationalism and the transformation of the National Rifle Association into a Second Amendment cult were white nationalist responses to the great successes of the civil rights movement and particularly black power, black panthers, and the U.S. defeat in the Vietnam War. In a way, the Second Amendment was a ticking time bomb. The genealogy of the ascension of constitutional originalism and the rise of white nationalist organizations begins with that Supreme Court decision to desegregate schools <clears throat> with opposing arguments in favor of so-called states' rights and of course, anti-communism was deeply embedded in all of it. So a counter-revolution took form, which interestingly was parallel to the progressive revolutions taking place. Was, was, uh, we weren't paying enough attention to it at the time. Quite immediately after uh, the Supreme Court decision in 54, white citizens councils formed in the southern states, along with other such groups, labeling all policies and acts of desegregation as communist. And that was often a code for Jewish. The John Burke Society, birthed in 1958 in Massachusetts by the sky under the Welsh, Welsh candy fortune, produced an ideology, a plan of action, and even a military arm for a while, the Minutemen. Fred Koch of the Koch Brothers Industries, uh, father of the brothers um, that remain a <coughs> small government or no government and free market funders, was a founding member of the John Burke Society. These were very, very wealthy people who founded this um, organization. This highly public reassertion of white supremacy and the Burke Society's methods of founding activist local chapters to take over school boards and other local offices across the country became a whole hallmark of the new right movement, embraced by the Transformed National Rifle Association, the same kind of organizing and chapters across the country concluding with the rising visibility and politicizing of the right-wing evangelical movement and the anti-abortion movement. So all these things were coming together in the early 1970s. Not only were Euro-Americans losing dominance, co uh, coinciding with the height of the civil rights movement, Socialist-oriented national liberation movements arose in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, a most succeeding in evicting French, Belgian, Dutch, Portuguese, and British colonizers from their countries. These movements inspired African Americans, Puerto Ricans, Native Americans, Chicanos, and Asian Americans, as well as white anti-imperialists and anti-war activists and students. These cracks in the empire, as we used to call them, um, really cracks in the racial order and settler colonialism, capitalism, 
constituted an extraordinary moment in the history of the United States. But it had the opposite effect on those who feared the loss of white supremacy and the loss of US supremacy in the world, and among the elite who feared loss of confidence in capitalism. The first time the white nationalist uh, movement revealed its collective political power was in support of Barry Goldwater's candidacy in 1964. Goldwater didn't make it that time, but the movement grew. So that in California, and particularly Orange County, um, became the avatar of the new right. Ronald Reagan was elected governor for two terms, serving from 1966 to 72 then became President of the United States in 1980, uh, giving a saying of, uh, as orange goes, so goes the nation. Orange is going in a different direction. <laughs> Mexican is retaking the territory. During the 1980s, longtime white nationalist groups such as the Klan and Aryan Nation grew, while dozens of other new ones were founded, continuing through the 1990s. Um, Reagan, for instance, was the first president to ever really address a uh, National Rifle Association uh, Convention. <coughs> so now we have to get to the National Rifle Association as um, how it became um, a, well, how it was a pretty stupid organization to begin with, <laughs> but how it became a menacing one, a white nationalist one, and a dangerous one. So the National Rationalization uh, Association was one of the formations um, that was transformed during this right-wing resurgence. Up until 1975, the NRA had not opposed gun regulations and had not made a fetish of the Second Amendment, hardly ever mentioned it. Mm -hmm. um, it had been founded following the Civil War by a group of former Union Army officers in the North to sponsor marksmanship training and competitions. That was partially related to um, uh, target shooting being included in the um, Olympics starting in, um, in the 1880s. <clears throat> in 1934, during the Depression, the NRA testified in favor of the first federal gun legislation that sought to keep the Thompson machine gun away from um, outlaws, such as the famous Bonnie and Clyde and Pretty Boy Floyd, my childhood heroes, <laughs> and <laughs> Chicago gangsters like Al Capone. So during the testimony, a congressman asked the NRA witness um, uh, if the proposed law would validate and violate the Constitution in his view. And the witness said that, he, that it wouldn't. So when the NRA opened a new headquarters in the 1950s, its marquee advertised firearm safety education, marksmanship training, and recreational shooting and hunting. Um, now, I think you know that it's hugely inscribed with um, uh, the right to bear arms, the Second Amendment. And they had no mention in, of the Second Amendment. I've gone, you know, I've gone to some of the records, and I couldn't find anything in their publicity that um, about the Second Amendment. But by the time of its 1977 convention, the right wing Second Amendment Foundation and its lobbying arm, the Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. Uh, founded in Washington State in 1974, seized leadership of the NRA. It was then that the NRA centered the Second Amendment as its main concern. The person who led that takeover was a man named Harlan Carter. He was a primary actor in the coup and um, he had an interesting past 
Carter followed his, the path of his father, who had been a U.S. border agent, border, border patrol's chief, uh, border patrol agent. Mm -hmm. And he became a border patrol chief himself. He had a checkered uh, past as a youth because he killed a fellow teenager, shot him, uh, who was Mexican, and was uh, sentenced to three years in prison, but it was overturned, so he served no time. As a U.S. Border Patrol Chief, Carter was head of the mid-1950s Operation Wetback. That was his official name. Program of violent, corrupt, racist, massive roundup, and deportation of uh, Mexicans, many of whom were citizens. NRA membership numbers soared during the early Reagan years in the White House. Um, in the 1980s, as California governor, Reagan had indulged the John Burke Society, which helped him win the California governorship. And then in 1980, as presidential candidate, he promised to implement Harlan Carter's NRA program and the policy agenda. So they made great gains during the 1980s. As for Carter, by the mid-1980s, gun cultists, even more fanatic than he was, threw him out of leadership and took over. So it has continued that way, just uh, getting more and more white nationalists and radical. So most gun control ad advocates and politicians to, uh, today blame the NRA for gun violence and proliferation of firearms. Calling the gun lobby, um, calling it a gun lobby uh, with big pockets, bribing elected officials. This is not really the power of the NRA. Um, if this were the case, gun control would be far easier to legislate since the gun control lobby actually spends far more money than the NRA, especially since Blooming, um, what's that guy's name that's running for president? Bloomberg. <laughs> Bloomberg. <laughs> Spent so much money. <laughs> you you no, know, the, the power of the NRA is completely different from lobbying and, and money. That's, that's really barking down, you know, a, a path that has nothing to bark at. Um, the National Rifle Association has around 5 million dues-paying members. Most of them are passive. I give the example, of, I belong to California AAA, which a lot of you do. It's a nonprofit membership organization, and every year we get this you know, packet of who we want to vote for for offices, and I toss it. I toss it in the trash, because <clears throat> I just, I'm a member of it to, you know, when I uh, have a blowout tire or run out of gas, I can call AAA. Well, these passive members of AAA, um, they get discounts on things. They get discounts, you know, stores and stuff, Walmarts. Walmarts has stopped, you know, mm -hmm. some of them have stopped doing these things. but. They need to know that they are in a white nationalist organization. You never say, well, I respect the members of the NRA, you know, some of them are really good people. Well, they should leave, because it is a white <laughs> nationalist organization. Uh, and the AAA is not. <laughs> but it's a nonprofit. The NRA is a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And its annual budget is $300 million. What? That is peanuts for lobbying. I mean, that is so little. All they do is monitor. It takes one person, basically, to go in and sit in Congress and keep tabs of anyone who brings up anything about gun regulation. Then they send this out all to all the chapters and say, get that guy out of there. He's talking about the gun control. Or support this candidate, because he's a booster. So it all works, I mean, it used to work by letter, you know, sending out letters, and it worked pretty well, but now it's even 
more effective because it goes out, you know, on um, on the internet. And so they lo they organize locally, and they're not like most of us the way we organize politically. They are true believers. <laughs> they're mm -hmm. fanatics, mm -hmm. and they're white nationalists. So that is the power of the NRA. They have chapters, multiple chapters in every state. Here in California, they have chapters, especially up in Northern California and the Central Valley. So even if they, NRA ceased to exist, if it just collapsed tomorrow, which everyone is saying, I want to look at it as collapsing, they have an internal problem, it wouldn't make any difference because they have these chapters. Um, it really wouldn't matter things would go on exactly the same. So because they work at the local level and gun laws are state and local. They're not, you know, federal gun laws are very few. It's a state's rights issue. So, um, David Cole, who's a close observer, I recommend reading his, his work in the National Review of Books, he writes, quite a few um, columns there. The NRA's power lies in the appeal of its ideas, its political engagement and acumen, and the intense commitment of its members. And that's why it's scary. It has nothing to do with money. And that, that's a real problem, you know, with uh, gun violence and gun control advocates is focusing too much on um, on NRA as a, as a uh, you know, if you could get rid of that, everything would be okay. It's, it goes so much deeper than that. So, um, the NRA and its constituency argue that the Second Amendment guarantees the right of every individual to bear arms without regulations while gun control advocates maintain, often say, they think the Second Amendment is about states continuing to have their own militias, emphasizing the language of well-regulated, and that that's, this is manifest in the National Guard. This is a really spurious argument, um, because the, the state militias uh, that existed in the Constitution. That's what, that's the genealogy of the National Guard in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution allows for what were the colonial militias like George Washington, you know, headed the Virginia colonial militia. Um, these were mil militaries, militias, militaries, and they they transformed into state militias, and later in the early 20th century, the Dick Law um, changed that to the word uh, National Guard for what they did. But their duties are to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. And the President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief of the state militias when called on actual service of the United States. That's a perfect description of the National Guard. So the Second Amendment has nothing whatsoever to do with the National Guard. Nothing. Unrelated. Totally. It's in the Bill of Rights. Why would they put it in the individual Bill of Rights when it's already in the Constitution? It makes no sense. It's a very weak argument. <laughs> Given that, what are now the state's National Guards are descended from the state militias, which were themselves republics from colonial militias. Why, um, what, what then are the militias referred to in the Second Amendment? This is where the blind spot comes in, the refusal to admit U.S. history. That is settler militias settler militias, individuals who come together very well-regulated. The well-regulated means 
not simply a band of outlaws running around robbing people. They're self-organized for a purpose, to take Indian land, and later they're repurposed for slave patrols. So this is very important to understand. So what kind of mentality does that create among um, white settlers? Historian uh, Charles Sellers wrote, cheap land held absolutely under the seaboard market's capitalist conception of property swelled patriarchal honor to heroic dimensions in rural America. The father's authority rested on his legal title to the family land, where European peasant land holdings were usually encumbered with obligations of some elite. The American farmer had fee simple. Supreme in his domain, he was beyond interference by any earthly power. Fee simple land, the augmenting theater of the patriarchal persona sustained in his honor and untrammeled will. The extraordinary independence inflated American farmers' conception of their class far above peasantry, even when they were dirt poor. Mm -hmm. So in a book written in the early 1800s, historian Joseph Doddridge, a minister and early settler in the Ohio country, wrote that on the frontier, every man was a soldier. And from early spring to late fall, was almost continually in arms. Their work was often carried on by parties, each one of whom has a rifle and everything else belonging to his war dress. These were deposited in some central place in the field a sentinel was stationed on the outside of the fence so that on the least alarm, the whole company repaired to their arms and were ready for combat in a moment. Who were they fighting? Who were they afraid of? Bears? Lions? What? Indians! They had stolen that land they're on. And the native people were trying to take it back or at least keep it them from expanding. That went on for 300 years across this continent. You have to comprehend what that means in terms of violence and what firearms mean, you know, the sacredness of the firearms to do that and the empowering of, of land and that so-called hunger for land. So settler militias and armed, armed households were inscribed as settler rights for the destruction and control of native peoples, communities, and nations. With the expansion of plantation agriculture by the late 1600s, they carved out um, slave patrols. Slave, I have a whole chapter on the slave patrols, and it's very important. Slave patrols. Um, did not come until the late 17th century, late 1600s. They came when uh, slavers from Barbados, the most vicious slave colony, where um, the torture, the, the lifespan of an unenslaved man working in the sugar fields would be about 25 years old, and they just replaced them the torture, the starvation. Um, there's this mythology that, well, slaves were happy because they were well fed, because they, that was in the interest of the slave owner. No, they used food as torture, the deprivation of food. And they were often skin and bones working and dying in the fields and replaced. So. This was a vicious, vicious um, system of, um, of uh, forced labor. Mm. So they brought slave patrols with them. They had developed them in Barbados. 
and they founded the South Carolina colony. If you want to wonder why South Carolina is the most vicious slave colony, that's why. But it spread then to Virginia, uh, to um, Georgia, you know, and, and especially to the Cotton Kingdom. And they became highly organized, self-organized among the slavers. Every white man had to serve in these slave patrols. These were not the same as those um, um, slave catchers, the ones that, you know, when they put out missing slaves that went and got, you know, found slaves and brought them in. These were organized slave patrols. I recommend Walter Johnson's book, River of Dark Dreams, for his um, documentation of the terror imposed by these slave patrols on their horses. Um, the horse and the dog were animals, beautiful animals trained to be objects of torture, uh, monsters. So, I wanted to wrap up so we have um, time to talk, but I, so I just want to make a couple of other points. Um, one is that the Second Amendment is a problem, but it probably can't be, it probably cannot be repealed because of what it takes to, you know, to constitutional change. Um, it made, it, the, the Founding Fathers purposely made it almost impossible to change their beautiful work of Polish art. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, it is almost impossible. But what we can do is totally um, tell the truth about the Second Amendment and make it so ugly that it, people stop praising it. Because here's a problem. People respect the Second Amendment. Um, after the Heller decision, which was a Supreme Court decision under Scalia in 2008 that found, for the first time, a Supreme Court decision. There are very few Supreme Court decisions having to do with firearms at all for the Second Amendment. But this one, a Washington, D.C. case that came um, found that um, the Second Amendment did uh, bestow the individual right to bear arms. Uh, he added to it that that didn't mean there couldn't be gun regulations, but in fact he was knocking down a gun regulation when he, um, when he did it. So, it, um, so Gallup did a poll uh, asking people do you believe the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guarantees the rights of Americans to own guns? Or do you believe it only guarantees members of state militias, such as the National Guard units, <coughs> the right to own guns? 73% agreed it was an individual right, while 20% said it was not. So, this means there's an enormous respect for the Second Amendment. That needs to be cut down to zero, or only the 10% of hardcore white nationalists who really know what it means. Um, I do believe it, because I know a lot of them. Some of them are my relatives. They know what it means. It means white nationalism. It means a trophy of killing Indians. It means the degradation of black people. This has to be um, the main effort, I think, of, of people who care about gun control and ending gun violence is to discredit, forget about repealing, forget about laws, discredit it by telling the truth about it. So that's one thing. The other is, is more difficult but needs to be incorporated into any efforts for gun control, and that is U.S. militarism. Mm -hmm. The fact that there has never been a day in U.S. history that the U.S. has not been 
warring against some group or some state or some nation or overthrowing governments. Not one day. I challenge people to find a day because <laughs> I haven't found it and I've been looking for it for about 40 years now. <laughs> so instead of dismissing, um, no, I want to go on to, to um, a kind of meditation that we need to do on the United States, just since World War II, when this, you know, when uh, huge changes have come about and white nationalism has, has risen um, with, and taken the presidency. The president is a white nationalist. And he has, he keeps saying he'll get his, his guys with guns and his bikers, the hell angels, you know, I don't think, I don't know if they really like Trump or not. <laughs> it doesn't seem like they're tight to me. <laughs> um, so you think about, since World War II, the counterinsurgency, the horrible killing of millions of people in Korea, in Vietnam, Central America, from 1981 to 1989, but you know, we go back to occupations of Nicaragua, occupations of, of Haiti, 35 years, occupation mm -hmm. of Haiti, military occupation, invasion, Dominican Republic. So we have Iraq, 1991, it's not just 2003, since 1991. Mm -hmm. um, and Afghanistan since 1979 didn't just start in 2001. These endless wars and continuing, and counting the dozens of, of brutal interventions and coups in Latin America and Caribbean and Africa and Asia, with flashes of historical memory at all times of Jamestown, the Ohio Valley, Wounded Knee, Sand Creek. This brings us to the essence of US history. A red thread of blood connects the first white settlement in North America with today and the future. As military historian John Grenier puts it, U.S. people are taught that their military culture does not approve of or encouraging, targeting and killing civilians, and know little or nothing about the nearly three centuries of warfare before and after the founding of the United States that reduced the indigenous peoples of the continent to a few reservations by burning their towns and fields and killing civilians, driving the refugees out step by step across the continent. Violence directed systematically against non-combatants through irregular means from the start has been a central part of the American way of war. So concerted attention to mass shootings has increased since the 2001 bombings of the Pentagon and the World Trade Center towers, followed by the U.S. wars in Afghanistan, and Iraq, and Libya, and Syria, and Yemen, and the Philippines. These are all ongoing. And brutal U.S. economic sanctions on many countries, casting overthrow of governments. It may be that mass killings at home are easier to grasp than that massive slaughter that's taking place in our name around the world. Almost like it's a microcosm of it act, being acted out by mostly somewhat you know, mentally ill people and of course a lack, total lack, lack of mental care in this country, any kind of human, humane mental care. So. It's mourning those who perpetrated, who, um, you can mourn those perpetrated it as military operations in the name of the people of the United States. How do you mourn those people? So it's easier with each mass killing. It's almost ritualized, if you notice it, the, the thoughts and prayers and the mm -hmm. sudden, you know, surge of doing legislation, then it goes, Nothing happens over and over. That's a ritual. 
Mm -hmm. It becomes a ritual. And I think it's related to not being able to grasp and deal with that larger militarism. Thus, we had prominent democratic officials, including Barack Obama, in an eight-year presidency, urgently calling for gun regulations and banning some weapons in the United States, while fully supporting the unlimited production of bombs, bombers, and drones to kill people on a daily basis. And it only got worse in 2017 when Trump proposed an $18 billion increase in the defense budget, only to be outdone by the Republican Congress members that the Democrats went along with, who drew up the two, uh, 2018 budget that increased um, even um, more, $37 billion. $37 billion. And now it's $660 billion. That's the budget. So U.S. militarism and endless wars, which began its, at its founding, or continued at its founding, is integrally related to the domestic gun proliferation and violence. I do get into, in the book, toward the end, uh, U.S. is a uh, gun exporter, the biggest gun exporter in the world, exporter of small arms, as well as big arms. Um, so I end with this, and I, I, it's a very sad story, but it's very, um, it's very important to get to this problem of militarism. The shooting in uh, February 14, 2018 uh, in Parkland, in Florida, the high school. The shooter, Nicholas Cruz, the former student at the school, and also, it was a very affluent suburb, by the way, of Miami, and he was from a very affluent family. He was an enthusiastic member of junior ROTC at that high school from the age of 11, learning and practicing shooting lethal military weapons in the school cafeteria. He wore the JROTC, the junior ROTC uniform, maroon t-shirt and khaki pants when he carried out the massacre. He was acting as a soldier. JROTC is a federal program sponsored by the U.S. Armed Forces in high schools and middle schools across the United States and on U.S. military bases across the world. The program was originally created as part of the National Defense Act of 1916. It's been going on for a long time and later expanded under the 1964 Act. The NRA provides for free the targets and other necessary items. But the saddest part of that is that these great young people who organized afterwards and had a huge rally in Washington, D.C., went across the country talking. They still are, they're still organized. Powerful. They, one of the victims, one of the dead, was also in JROTC. And they organized a military funeral for him. So this disconnect of the military and the gun violence is just, is deadly. Thank you. So if ever built, what will the United States Native American Genocide Memorial Museum contain? What will it exhibit? It will be one room, a 50-foot square, with the same large photo filling the walls, ceiling, and floor. There will be only one visitor allowed at any time. There will be no furniture. That one visitor will have to stand or sit on the floor or lie on the floor if they feel the need. 
that visitor must remain in that room for one hour. There will be no music. The only soundtrack will be random gunshots from rifles used throughout American history. Reverberation. What will that one photo be? It will be an Indian baby <coughs> shredded by a Gatling gun, lying dead and bloody in the snow. So, question. Question. Now, do they have a microphone? They don't. So, if you, if you want to, either you can get up and talk to yeah, them, or else just get up and shout. Can, feel free to come up and use a microphone. Sure. So I, I just moved here after living in Reading for nine years, which is actually has the highest gun ownership in California. Is it? Is it? Right I think so. Yeah. One thing I noticed is um, all the concealed carry, like uh, advertising, was very paranoia driven. You know, fear of the criminal invading your house sort of thing. Right. So I was wondering if your book or in your research you came across that theme throughout history of the paranoia, whether it's racial paranoia or just paranoia. Yeah, that's, that's really a good point. Um, by the way, a lot of my compatriots from Oklahoma uh, ended up from ready oh. <laughs> and other places in the city. Um, I always feel quite at home when I'm in these places. Well, you know, I, I describe that sense of power that you feel when you have a gun. So, so many people are reproducing themselves, you know. They grow up in a family or community with weapons, and without them, they feel they feel paranoid. Someone's going to get them because it's a false sense of power. Because this is another thing um, I actually learned um, uh, while doing gun training is that, and of course, I didn't go to the NRA for gun training, you know, but is a firearm is not a defensive weapon. A firearm is an offensive weapon. Unless you want to uh, do anticipatory um, self-protection, that is, shoot first. And that's what people are doing. They're just shooting someone, you know, who happens to walk across their lawn or whatever. Um, and, you know, or like Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, just shoot and find out later whether or not that was really a danger. So, but there is that white nationalism or any kind of culty thing is inherently paranoia. I mean, I'm not a psychologist. And I don't like to. I don't like to medicalize these things. But that sense of invasion of people are after you and you have to protect your property, protect your family. Part of that is the patriarchal persona mm -hmm. that is, you know, is inflated. And um, so what this does is, you know, this proliferation of guns, um, it does several things. One is, um, is the absolute, uh, um, conclusion of, let's say, a, a domestic violent situation, which is almost 99% of the time a man, um, say, this has happened to women uh, for centuries, I guess, you know, being stomped on, slugged in every part of the body, maybe every bone in the body broken, slammed against walls. They can survive, usually. But if there's a gun, that's it. Same with suicide, attempted suicide. Um, almost every person who's attempted suicide and has been rescued from it in the act, in the middle of it, are grateful. Because everyone, at some moment, has this. I think it's normal. I don't think it's even you know, a mental illness or anything. It's, that, that I don't have any reason to live, or let's say it's an elderly person, or let's say um, 
a young person who feels bullied um, that there's nothing. Well, you know, they get through that crisis, but if there's a gun and they're feeling that well, it's so easy to say, well, I'll just end this, you know, and it's so final. It's not like taking pills. Most people survive that. Um, fortunately, they're getting the net on the Golden Gate Bridge one of these days, I don't know when. In the meantime, a bunch of people are dying every week, jumping off that bridge, you know. So that's, um, that's the uh, thing. So when this man has his guns in his house to protect his property, he's a walking danger to the rest of his family if he goes off on something. By the way, um, one of the problems with police an FBI reporting of uh, gun deaths is when they consider mass shootings. You know, mass shootings, the definition, the official definition by the FBI is four people dead. Four people dead, not including the shooter. That's, that's a, a mass shooting that is someone who, not a serial killer over time, Someone who goes in some kind of public place, and sometimes it's a workplace and he knows the other people, sometimes it's a jealousy thing, but generally it's people they don't know and simply starts shooting and four people are killed. That, that's a mass shooting. So there are kind of numbers, you know, of mass shootings that people inflate that, um, that don't really fit in that category that the police and the FBI do. But what they don't do, and I think even a lot of gun advocates don't do, is count the domestic violence killings by gun. It has soared, it has soared with this increased proliferation of gun ownership. So again though, we have to remember this is only 30% of the population, put it in perspective. Why is the other 70% of the population not feeling like they have to have guns? And do you feel like you have to have a gun in your home to protect yourself? I live in San Francisco, you know, pretty close to the Tenderloin, and, and the next door thing, that, talk about paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living in the same neighborhood, and I never see any of these things going on that they're talking about, you know? And I've lived there for 20 years, so. Anyway, um, now, so, you have a question? Yes, I was going to ask you about the monuments when you travel through, say, the Midwest, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, and you see these monuments to where the cavalry defeated the Indians, mm -hmm. or right there, these forts. Uh, these forts were there to kill the Indians. Right. Is there any kind of movement to, to, to to take these things down? Because it's not only on the highways, it's actually on the reservations too, where these things, atrocities have taken place. Yeah, there is. Um, it focuses on uh, Wounded Knee, the Wounded Knee um, uh, plaque that uh, the US Army installed. Uh, because, you know, in the US Army annals, Wounded Knee is counted as a battle. And in the, you know, the literally on, on the, um, these pages they used to keep, win or lose the battle, mm -hmm. it's a win. They gave 28 medals of honor to those soldiers of the 7th Cavalry, Custer's Old Cavalry, mm -hmm. who were committing a revenge for the Big Horn. Um, so there's been a movement for decades now um, to rescind those Congressional Medals of Honor, but also change that, take away that plaque, that it's a battle. Because it has, it has repercussions, you know, throughout the military culture, they see this, these ribbons for one battles are put in every military base, on every battleship, um, in the country, and West Point, and you know, and Annapolis, and all. So there, it's normalizing genocide and massacres, 
as well if you can call wars legitimate, you know, legitimate wars or wars of, of defense or whatever. So that's one thing, but um, yeah, there's, uh, they're all over the place like that because they basically, the military, um, you know, I, I quoted John Grenier, he wrote a whole book on this, is that, that the U.S. military is inherently counterinsurgent. They turn to counterinsurgency. That's just a word. People don't think about, well, what does that mean, counterinsurgency? It means attacking civilians and their food supplies. It means driving them out, you know, creating refugees. So you see, this is always what the U.S. military falls back on. Even during the Civil War, you know, that, that, that uh, um, it's not always even a winning proposition. It certainly didn't work in Vietnam. Right. They killed five million Vietnamese people, most of them civilians, in this method. And it's, it doesn't necessarily bring a win of a war, but it's, um, it's, it's not just the NRA, it's not just the civilian gun violence, but within the military itself, that counterinsurgency, which was officially revived during the Afghan war, uh, during the uh, George W. Bush administration. We'll probably have time for one more question, and then uh, Roxanne will come over here and sign books. Oh, and sign books. Maybe we could have a woman ask a question. Thank you. Hi. Um, so first of all, this was really enlightening, and um, my question, as a, as an activist and you know, uh, somewhat pragmatic in some ways, my question is, how do we begin teasing out and sharing what you're teaching us? So like thinking about people who I know who are you know activists and who have the narrative you described, the typical NRA um, narrative. How do we begin doing that without, like, you know, in one fell swoop, you know, changing people's entire world? Like, how do we just begin that? <laughs> well, I think instead of, um, you know, existing groups, they, um, I haven't had much success in convincing them, you know, to, for a different point of view. Uh, but they're very few and um, not all that effective. Um, they put a lot into it. They're very caring people, and many of them are um, relatives of, of, of um, victims of violence. So it's always, you know, it, it, it's difficult to um, say, well, you've got to look at the history at all when, when there's real grief there that they're working from. So I think, for instance, DSA should take it up. You know, take it up as a, as a teaching tool in all of the political work, that all uh, progressive political organizations who are not now doing any kind of work around gun violence. Um, there's another issue that um, is problematic. Uh, the, you know, people ask me when I go around talking about this book, do any of the, you know, gun people come in? Well, maybe they do, maybe they're here right now, but they never say anything that they, sometimes I can kind of sense, but they don't speak up. Um, but who does speak up are members of Redneck Revolt and the John Brown uh, Gun Club and the Huey Newton Gun Club and others that have sprung up in the last uh, 10 years or so. I think Redneck Revolt was started, I think, about 10 years ago. Uh, so they love the Second Amendment. They're, they're completely um, uh, basing it on, you know, the, um, the Black Panther experience of the late 60s. But this, this, what, to me, what the Black Panther experience tells us is that black people and socialists and Native Americans with guns will be criminalized. 
So do you really want to put your fight into having the right to be honored by the Second Amendment when you're talking about overthrowing the U.S. government? Um, you want to do it legally with the Second Amendment? I mean, it, it, it's a string, very strange contradiction, you know, that no, they're not going to allow that. So it seems to me, as, you know, the lesson to take from the Black Panther experience is that the Second that that you will not have your constitutional right to the Second Amendment. Because, um, you know, a, a, a state senator from Montana yesterday said that, that socialism was um, made illegal in the Constitution and all socialists should be shot. <laughs> he did. Yeah. Um, so, I think to, so the other day there was a big uh, rally at uh, um, Richmond, Virginia. Did any of you notice the big gun rally? Because state of Virginia now under a liberal democratic regime is uh, trying to put through some gun controls. So they came to protest and it was on uh, Martin Luther King Day. They had their gun rally. They have it every year, their gun rally. I mean, the, the, um, the legislature wasn't legislating it at that moment, so they didn't come to protest precisely, say, don't vote for this. They do that every year. They've been doing it for several years. Uh, that is what they think of Martin Luther King Day, is to you know come, all white people come with their guns <laughs> and rally, so, and not, even mentioned Martin Luther King. Um, but the uh, local chapter of Redneck Revolt um, said, now these are young white anarchists, you know, who consider themselves uh, on the left. They, um, they were going to go and join them, you know, for the right to the Second Amendment and against gun control. When they saw all these white nationalists coming in, you know, I don't know who they thought would come to this rally otherwise. It's like farmers. It's like they decided maybe they shouldn't go, but that they would even have the idea that they should align themselves. You know, it's very naive. You know, it's very naive, and so. Um, I haven't had anyone tonight, but nearly every time I speak, there is someone from one of these uh, groups that, uh, and I know some of them very well personally, and talk to them, I'm blue in the face, but they've gotten into the gun cult, you know? They've gotten into gun love, and it is addictive. That's why I say stay away from guns. <laughs> okay. All right.